I want to start first by explaining kind of the DNA that I'm, I have, and then we can sort of think about what might happen when it collides with the Media Lab. <clears throat> so my DNA is I'm an internet entrepreneur. And if we can get the slide up. <clears throat> Are you guys seeing the slide? Yeah. OK, good. So, so this is how innovation used to work around IT. You would have big companies, governments, with experts wearing neckties going to intergovernmental bodies, anticipating every single problem you could ever imagine for years and years and years, and creating these mile-high specifications that would cost billions of dollars to deploy, like we were talking about. So when you're deploying infrastructure, you need to figure out what you're trying to do so that when you deploy it, because you can't change it, you can't be agile. And then the consumer buys it and pays tax, and it goes around and around. This actually ties a lot with the previous discussion. It turns out that the internet was a thing where you didn't need this kind of planning. In fact, David Weinberger uses the phrase, small pieces loosely joined. Small, scrappy little standards, loosely connected by open standards, where you did this thing, which is rough consensus running code, where everything was kind of flat, and you used the internet, and you connected. And it was much more of a meritocracy. You didn't have to be a special expert with a government stamp. You could be a 14-year-old and go to the Internet Engineering Task Force, write some code, and people would listen to you. And so suddenly, the world became flat. Everything became messier, more agile, and the government wasn't in charge anymore. And so we ended up with what I call the, the standard stack. And this is kind of the geeks in the room will uh, you know, complain that it's not really a stack like this. But it's roughly a stack like this. And it used to be that governments, if you, if so, you guys are mostly young in here, but I remember when you had to have government approval to connect your modem to the phone line. Well, what the internet allowed with these open standards that didn't have government control was it gave you freedom to hack freedom to access, freedom to innovate without asking permission. And what that did was it substantially lowered the cost of collaboration, distribution, and it allowed anyone to participate. And you had things like TCP IP created Cisco. Arguably, you have Ethernet creating things like 3Com. And at each layer of the internet standards, you had explosions of innovation. But what's really important is these are little nonprofits, not very big, and they're not controlled by governments. And they don't go around in this big cycle. And you don't have to wear a necktie to go to the standards meetings. And so what that does is it substantially changes the notion of risk. So a big telephone company in Japan, it cost them about $100 million to swing the bat and to figure out whether they want to try something. So for a telco in Japan, the business has to be about $10 billion before it's worth even trying to get. And we, we heard from Eric, if you think about the lean startup, well, if it only costs you nothing or $10,000 to try something out, you can try everything out. And you don't have to plan it. And it turns out it costs more to figure it out and plan it than it does to actually try it. And so that really changed the nature of risk. So you have people on the East Coast, a lot of the big companies, sitting around worrying about all of the downside. What is the project of run? How much is it going to cost to figure this out? And then the upside is this little incremental increase. So this is the, what a brain of a senior executive in a big company typically looked like. They were focused on the downside risk and not that focused on the upside opportunity. Whereas a VC's brain looks kind of like this. So you have you know, little $10,000 bets, and the most money you're ever going to lose is the money you put in. But if you go and try to extract that money out and minimize the risk, your time's worth more than the money you put in. And what you're looking for are those breakaways, those really big shot things. And you're trying to make a 10x thing into a 100x thing into a 1,000x thing. And it's a very different kind of mentality. And this is the mentality that sort of you know, grew up in Silicon Valley and, and sort of dominates the consumer internet world. It doesn't dominate most of the world, interestingly. So um, this is an interesting chart. Um, by one of our professors at the Media Lab. And so this is a total amount of information in the world. This is time. And ov as over time, the world is getting more complex. And so when you had little arrowheads, you could kind of figure it out in one human brain. And as the products and stuff got more complicated, you needed the firm in order to, because one person couldn't contain all the information needed to create something, you do it inside of a firm. So you'd share inside of organizations. But organizations protected their intellectual property from each other. Well, it turns out that as the world gets more complex and we create these networks, you can no longer, within just one company, hold all the information needed for an ecosystem. Doubling the number of people in IBM doesn't double the amount of complexity that IBM can understand. It actually starts to get, and we have Brooks Law and other things. So, so the world is becoming much more networked and is becoming an ecosystem. 
And so there's this great book by John Sidney Brown called The Power of Pull. I don't push it just because I'm in it, but I really believe it. And the power of pull is this idea that instead of stocking information, assets, money, and planning everything centrally, like the big companies and governments do, you pull the things together as you need it. And again, this ties to a lot of the lean startup stuff. You don't actually know what you're going to need, so you figure it out as you go along. You embrace serendipity, and you don't plan everything. And if you look at YouTube, it was a dating site with a video when it started out. And if you look at PayPal, it was a, it was a mobile app. If these guys had planned 10 years, and they had promised to their investors and they just executed on that plan, they wouldn't have gotten where they were. And again, it gets back to the lean startup. But this idea of, of sort of letting it happen is somewhat of a religious thing, right? A, a lot of people just can't do it. And the people who have lived in the internet and worked with startups have come to the point where you know that you don't have to know the whole of it. That, in fact, your compass is better than the map, because the map is going to be outdated, wrong, and too expensive to build. And so there's a whole philosophy around this whole agile world that I think many of us have. And then we get the Media Lab. So the Media Lab is 25 years old. This was invented by Nicholas Negroponte when he wrote this book, Being Digital. It was before we had the PC in its current form. It was like, it was very man-machine days, right? We didn't have the internet. We were just figuring out the fax machine. You know, it was so, so, so if you imagine 25 years ago, it was really about sort of the future of user interface and computing. And over this 25 years, the, the Media Lab has been doing a lot of really amazing things. But one of the things the Media Lab tends to do is it tries to do new things. It actually invented a lot of the really early social media stuff. But they get off bandwagons the minute they see them go. Well, it turns out this internet bandwagon took a pretty long ride, right? So, so they, they still do a lot of internet stuff, but the networking hasn't been as much of a focus as some of the other stuff. Um, but it is about to become more of a focus. Um, so this is the media. One, another good thing about having just become the director is I didn't have to raise money for this building, and it was just finished a year ago. Um, so it's a great building because it was designed with the way we work in mind. And the way that the Media Lab works, so it's, it's actually under the architecture school, but it's, we got lots of open space, and we have these. Um, this is one of the labs, but the idea is we build stuff. We don't sit around and talk about stuff. We don't sit around and write papers. You have an idea, you go and build it. And, and the whole idea is that and, and, and this, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but for multidisciplinary work, building something creates a certain kind of rigor that sitting around and having a sociologist and a mathematician and an economist arguing about something won't solve. And so, so the build, it's a very build culture. Um, it was, you know, it's about 25 now, 28 faculty, 140 students, 300 research projects, and 70 sponsors. And they do all kinds of stuff in this environment. But the key is it's <coughs> multidisciplinary. So, um, we really don't have very many of the same category of people. And we have just about every kind of person, which I'll describe. And it really is about building. Um, some of the professors will urge their students to write papers, but every student has to be able to build what they do. And all the professors are selected by their ability to express their ideas in some sort of physical form and through collaboration. And agility is really important, which is interesting. So we have long-term projects, but there is a lot of the same DNA I was talking about earlier. Um, so, you know, it, so this is just every professor is in a different field. We don't have two professors ever that are doing the same thing. And so this is going to be a crazy thing. I'm going to go through all of the, the, the groups, but I'm not going to talk about them. You can just sort of see the diversity that we have. We've got cities, we've got um, AI, we've got interfaces, we've got um, low tech, we've got social networks, we've got um, big data, we've got robots, we've got education, we've got molecular biology solving blindness, we've got bits that move around, we've got physical spaces, we've got biomechatronics. This is um, one of our professors who um, is a double amputee, and he is able to walk in a normal gait without any kind of, um, you won't be able to tell, except that I'm running out of time. Um, but I'll let him walk. So, so he's a great example. So Hugh is a mountain climber who lost both legs, and he decided to come to the Media Lab. And only at the Media Lab could he get the guy who can write the mobile app and the pe people who figure out the sensors and figure out that you can put nerves into skin and so you can feel the bottom of his feet hopefully soon, and, and that we have the gate people. And it brings all these disciplines together, so now he can run two miles in the morning and have a perfectly normal gait um, with lots of different technologies. We've got Opera. We've got um, lots of other stuff. And so let me just get to my next slides. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it from a container to a platform. 
change it from a focus on products into ecosystems. I'm stopping the, the use of the name sponsor. They're members. They're members of a team, a members of a club. It's a network rather than um, a thing. And these are some of the things I've already done. Blog, Creative Commons, Open Data. We're doing innovation on IP. We're streaming our talks. We've opened our members' meetings. And this will lead to the next talk. But I think th what we can do is take the West Coast DNA and bring it to the East Coast. I think we're better than the West Coast on open data. We've got a lot of big data here that they don't have on the West Coast. And I, don't th I think we're better at making open standards and APIs over here. So yay, East Coast. <laughs> All right. See you later.